Welcome to another VC Wisdom Pod round two with Jordan Green. Jordan just got awarded a member of the Order of Australia for his role that he played in the startup slash angel investing community in Australia. So congrats to Jordan on that one. It's a pretty big one. Our last convo was pretty fun. So today's an extension of that. Jordan, can you say a little hello again? Tell us uh, what you're up to and how have your life changed since that uh, little medal that you got? <laughs> Thank you very much. Good to be here again, Charles. Um, I'm not sure that the uh, that the award has changed my life that much, but uh, it's very it, it it's very um, very much appreciated that that the community have chosen to to recognize my contribution in this way and, and that my country has chosen to acknowledge it um so really just sort of very privileged and and proud to have received this uh this recognition um well, otherwise you know, the accomplishment been... of a career uh it's pretty important uh how did you feel when you received that uh well uh you know surprised because uh it's a it's a process where i only find out once everybody has decided that that it's going to happen. Um, so somebody, I actually don't know who at this stage, somebody decided to put my name forward and, and build a, a case. Uh, and then there's a committee of people who review all of that. And they all make their decisions. Uh, they review their assessment and their decisions without me even knowing it's happening. And then, you know, I just got an email saying, look, by the way, some people have done this and um, just giving you a heads up, you're going to receive this award. And the only reason that they sent me an email ahead of the, the day it was announced is because they do release it to the media under embargo. And so they want you to know that you might be given the contact. But so in Australia, this happens twice a year on um, our, our national day, Australia Day, which is when mine was announced last week uh, or two weeks ago. And then on what we now call the King's Birthday, uh, in the middle of the year. Do you feel it was deserved? If you look and try to quantify your accomplishment, it seems to me that you've created a couple of forests and ecosystems in the startup world, haven't you? Oh, I, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, that's been the plan. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I initiated the Organized Angel Investor Community in Australia and uh, and extended that work uh, to help friends in New Zealand and across Asia and to participate in the leadership of angel communities in, in USA and, and Europe. So um, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's great people to be working with. Um, the angel investors are, are very impressive individuals. Um, and, uh, and of course, it means you're working with lots and lots of founders. And some of those, most of those are good people. Some of those maybe not. Um, but you know, that's life and that's that's the process and do you feel working in the startup community and trying to have it flourish do you feel it's the best thing you can do for australia as a country and potentially even the world uh in a lot of ways yes that's that's why i i you know focused on it for so long um i think building a, a thriving startup community so understanding uh, your audience, I'm sure, understand, but but just to go back a bit because this conversation often gets off on the wrong foot. A startup to me means a company that is trying to do something that is going to change the world and is trying to do it as quickly as possible. Now, it might only be changing the world in some tiny little way, uh, and the only startups I want to support are whether change to the world is a constructive and positive change. Not all changes are necessarily that, but but that's what a startup is, and and it's important that it's changing the world and trying to do it really quickly. Those two things really define a startup. Um, and then as working to encourage the ecosystem, that means I'm working to encourage the, those positive changes, um, the employment that they bring, the diversification that they bring, to the extent that there is constructive disruption of business models or, or economic status quo. Um, then that's also a valuable thing to be doing. Uh, and certainly when doing it from a place like Australia, a large part of that growth has to be uh, has to be international um, because we're a relatively small community. So it's very much about 
benefiting the country and and the broader economy, um, both in Australia and, and outside. So it's a it sounds very grand, but it starts with these small steps of you know you and I doing what we do, helping individuals, and you know, we all work together. We all stand on the shoulders of those who come before us. Um, you know, and it takes a whole lot of bricks to build a massive success. And Canva being a prime example of that. Uh, Canva is a great, a great Australian success story. Absolutely, Canva and Atlassian are two of the big globally known software names. Myob, um, you may know about that one too. Um, there, there's lots of great Australian success stories. Uh, not all of them have the consumer awareness of of Canva, but absolutely, there are a lot of great Australian success stories. How could you maximize your own impact, like? Could you try to fund a bunch of startups that are changing the world as quick as possible? Is that like your uh, OS on a daily basis? Uh, well, yeah, that's been my that's been my goal um, over the last twenty odd years uh, to to find the ones that are trying to do something I think is going to be really valuable, um, valuable to to society, and of course commercially very successful um, and it's important to recognize that there's nothing wrong with those two things working together um, there are a lot of people who feel the need to say well you can't do good things and and make money um, but we used to shorten it to say angel investors want to um, do good and do well uh, because at the end of the day if a company I invest in can be hugely successful and give me a, a lot of money back, that gives me more money to invest in more companies. And you get this very virtuous cycle going on that helps build and grow uh, everything. And the difference, particularly in the last sort of 10 or 15 years, uh, is that prior to that, the sort of the, the, the mainstream economy was, was adequate to employ everybody. Um, but these days it's not. And so creating new jobs and new opportunities for people to work in, in different ways, which is a lot of what startups allow to happen, uh, is, is critical to everybody being able to find a way to work. On your side, um, Jordan, what do you think about VC and capital being taken too far, let's say SoftBank that goes and spends billion for nada. Is there such a thing or it was still a good experiment? Oh, I think it's important to understand what venture capital is. I I mean, to me, when, when I was taking venture capital in Silicon Valley and when I've been running a venture capital fund here in Australia, uh, it is still very much about investing in startups with the added uh, the added extension that if you've got a decent sized fund, you can be investing in an early stage startup and then supporting it through its its growth. Um, so that's what it should be. Otherwise, in fact, all the things I said about angel investing are are the classic descriptions of of venture capital. When you start talking about organisations that are deploying multi billion dollar funds, they're not really venture capital; they're private equity. Uh, and um, and that's a different type of investment. Uh, and that's why there are a lot of the, so Sequoia has gone on to become a private equity fund. People like um, Kleiner Perkins have resisted raising billion dollar funds specifically because they realize funds of that scale don't allow them to do genuine startup venture style investing. So it's not that one or the other is right or wrong, but you do need to understand that the quantum of money has a distinct impact on the type of investing that can be done and how it plays out. Um, has I, I, I do think that in the last few years, we've probably entered another venture bubble um, like we did in certainly in the dot-com days and probably again, sort of roughly 10 years later. Um, and here we are roughly 10 years later again. Uh, so there are a lot of new people around the world um, entering the venture world saying that they're going to be VCs. Um, there's a lot of confusion because a lot of those people don't raise funds, and so founders get think they're being introduced to a venture capitalist, who but a venture capitalist who has no money is not a venture capitalist. 
Um, they could be a, a great advisor. They could be a great agent. They could be great at many different things. But if they're saying they're a venture capitalist and they don't have a fund, then they're not telling the truth. What are you seeing in this current market that most people are not seeing? You know, the movie Don't Look Up. Uh, where are people not looking up in this current market? That's an interesting question. Um, I think a lot of people are looking, still looking very short term. So, you know, they're looking for, so we've had the, the various versions of, you know, the VC drought or whatever people want to call it over the last couple of years with, with a, a boom in investments in, in 21, 22, and then uh, late 22 and 23, perhaps a, a significant drop off, uh, these things happen all the time. Uh, and now that startups are so much more pervasive and mainstream, more people are aware of this stuff. And now there's a lot of pressure to say that they're, they're, everyone's looking for things to turn up again. Um, but today is different. Um, you know, if you go back 20 years, the world basically, well, the, certainly the startup world basically revolved around one comprehensive perspective perspective so if there was a bubble it was a bubble for everybody these days the bubbles are all subtle and overlaid so ai has had nothing but strong support for the last couple of years uh and and more but certainly in the last couple of years when other sectors have had challenges raising capital um ai has continued to to get all the money that it needs so to speak um and that's because there is a bubble around that uh the, whereas fintechs have slowed off quite remarkably. Uh, so that's their bubble shrinking, if you will. I'm not even sure that these bubbles burst these days too often. Uh, it's more that they sort of they expand and they shrink and they're all overlapping. So someone who's doing AI in fintech can probably still get funding. Um, and of course, that's why every startup you see <laughs> claims they've got AI in their business. Um, and so it's up to the investors to have the, the understanding and the 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 the, um, the perception to actually understand to, to see whether the claimed AI element of a business is is significant or not. I mean, just using ChatGPT to write your copy doesn't make you an AI business. What other bubbles are you seeing out there? For example, I think corporations are bubbles, inflated, bloated. Uh, giants you know um for lack of a better word i also think real estate's a bubble in many sense um meaning that the fundamentals are not there but there's just a bunch of humans convincing themselves that there are and the value of the thing just goes up um where do you see bubbles in uh, in other places than techs and, and startups in this whole global market um well, I have to say the way you just described things, the first thing that leaps to my mind is the whole world of crypto um, because there are there is absolutely valuable technology inside that world or Web3, if that's a broader label perhaps. Um, but so much of what goes on, particularly around the, the cryptocurrency, is what you just described. It's a whole bunch of mutual belief. Now, you could argue that's true of every economy, um, but... Uh, and and you mentioned property. Uh, you know, property depends which country you're in, which part of which country. Ultimately, property comes down to micro markets, you know, which which house on which street. Uh, so, I, I think there is a problem in in um, developed economies that property has been overblown, and valuations have have gone through the roof. And I think in most developed economies. We're seeing a significant affordability crisis, where where um, you know, people who don't already own property find it very hard to get into the property market, uh, and that's that's important because it attacks a core assumption of the societies, those societies. Now there are other there are other communities around the world where most people have rented their entire lives and never expected to own property. Uh, and so that's a very different situation, although property prices still affect rents. So so it is still relevant. Um, obviously, we've got a whole lot of issues around energy. Uh, 
so as we try and transition away from fossil fuels, uh, we, we're increasing our own costs until we can get through the transition and find that that you know operating steady state where all of the renewable energy systems are in place and and the long term savings of doing all of that should start to to materialize but it so you know, electric cars are, are for the most part hugely expensive um and uh, and that's a challenge for a lot of the people who might want to embrace that but they have to pay three or four or more times the price of the car that they drive to buy an electric car. And it's not about someone sitting back and talking about the lifetime economics, because those people have to decide whether or not they will borrow money to buy that car. And the financiers have to decide whether or not they'll lend that money. And now we're in a world where interest has returned so you know you've probably lived most of your life in a world where there was no interest, um, but I remember a world where interest was a daily concern and inflation was a daily measure on the news. And now we're back in that world after quite a long time with without that, and that's having an impact across the board. It's changing perceptions and expectations, uh, and among other things, to bring it back to startups, it's continuing to increase the cost of startups because the cost of people is going up. So if the cost of living is going up, people have to get paid to afford to live. That means the cost of people goes up. People are almost always the largest single cost of any startup or any business really. But And so that that is making startups more expensive. And conversely, that is putting more downward pressure on valuations for early stage startups, because as they get more expensive, they're perceived to be more financially risky and the more risk you ask investors to take, um, then the, the lower the valuation they they want to take that risk on. Is that making sense? Yes. I have a question though on the VC model VS bootstrap. We briefly discussed that, I believe, last interview. Um, your goal is to accelerate these startups as fast as possible, but do you foresee a future in which uh, startups will run on their own capital, ma mainly that they would deploy AI agents so fast and test out so quick in this market that they could almost instantly get that capital back and sell and sell fund and bootstrap till billions? Sam Altman has predicted the one person billion dollar company uh, is coming pretty soon. What do you have to say to that? Um, well, in one sense, uh, I, I don't know that it necessarily has to relate to AI. AI is a, a newly emerged tool, but there are lots of tools. Uh, uh, that's, so the decision to be growing fast is always has to be relative to whatever it is you're doing. Um, and it's it's one way to go. But even growing fast doesn't mean you have to take investment capital. I mean, so certainly when I first started creating businesses, no one thought about getting investment capital. Everyone thought about how to gener generate enough revenue to, to grow the business. That's what everyone focused on. That's what people did. And those are the companies investors most want to invest in. They're the easiest ones to take a risk on. And today, uh, as you say, with all sorts of other changes going on, with with it's and even you don't even have to question the venture model. You just have to recognize that venture capital is only suitable for a very very small subset of all the possible businesses that are out there. And of the ones that it's suitable for, there is only enough capital to fund a small subset of those. So venture capital in the world, if you, have, if you have a massive pipe, a torrent of companies, startups, try to grow, venture capital is, is a bottleneck that only suits a, a small number of those and only funds an even smaller number. That doesn't make it good or bad, right or wrong. That's just the nature of the beast. And for all of those other companies, all of those ones that are, are trying to grow and can build, as you say, um, build their opportunities quickly, and if they can use AI or, or other tools 
to rapidly iterate their engagement with the market and get to the point where they're generating their own revenues, then I think that's great. And, and yes, I do agree that there is the room for and the likelihood for a lot more companies to start following the more traditional revenue-based model. And once you're doing that and doing it well, you, you may never need um, investment capital and you can grow to be a highly valuable company. And, and a simple example from what we said at the beginning of the call, we I, I mentioned Atlassian, which is a company I think many of you, your listeners will have heard of. Atlassian's an Australian company. They they bootstrapped. I, I think they might have had some some you know sort of small investment from from high net worths, but they effectively they bootstrapped all the way into being a global company before they took on board any kind of investment capital. Uh, another Australian startup here in Melbourne that that dominated the world in online design for many years called Ninety Nine Designs. Same thing. They became the number one website number one business of their type in the world before they considered taking any venture capital investment so it's it's not new um it's probably something more commonly done outside places like silicon valley you know silicon valley is a very uh snowball you know it's a, it's a very particular subset of life experience and business opportunity uh but recognize that it's Silicon Valley, you know, it's, it's, it's 50 kilometers long. Um, the world is a big place and there are people creating real value in real businesses in, in every country on the planet. Uh, and so I think we will see a lot more of, uh, of these bootstrap and, and self funded businesses growing to success and, and to prominence. Do you think that capitalism can scale forever or are we about to hit diminishing returns with the environment and some of the micro wars we're seeing out there? <laughs> well, with just a few minutes left, that's a huge topic to touch on. Um, hey, major I, questions, I call them. Uh, look, I, I think there are, um, I think there are different forms of capitalism and there's nothing inherently wrong with the basic concepts, perhaps, of capitalism, uh, but it has to be moderated with, with other priorities. It's not an absolute answer on its own. Uh, I do think that there are a bunch of examples around the world where, where societies have got themselves out of whack, out of balance, and, and the, the, the profit motive and the money focus has, has completely undermined social values and and even economic rationale uh so i don't think it's all going to necessarily explode everywhere i think there are going to be places that have to find a way to to readjust and some of those quite radically uh and in, you know again people want to talk about economists um, but economists take lots of different views of the world and have lots of different lenses through which they view these things uh, we can't ignore the real imperatives around us. The planet is telling us we're not going to be able to survive if we don't do things to, to change our environment because we've changed it too far in the wrong direction. So that's there. That's real. That's everybody on the world is experiencing extraordinary weather events you know, and the impacts of all the other elements of, of climate change. Uh, so to imagine that one can run a, an economic system like capitalism without taking into account the the physical imperative of the world in which it exists is just naive. Uh, but how to do that is going to continue to take a real effort. I do think a bunch of our political model systems like parties and, and a lot of our international organizations have have stagnated or or um, found themselves losing their way and they either need to be completely refreshed or perhaps it's time to set them aside and and try something new uh, but these are these are big big challenges when you ask the beginning what do I see that others don't see I don't know that others don't see it 
but there are a lot of people in the world today who were alive when the Second World War started, and a lot of them are looking at the world today and saying, this is just like them, right? The, 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 the ridiculous positions that are, the, the extreme positions, the, the, the um, fascist positions that are being taken by, by people like um, Putin and Russia in their war on the Ukraine and their constant effort to undermine lots of other regimes to distract from what's going on in the Ukraine, the efforts by countries like Iran to foment um, you know, at least a war across their entire continent. Uh, you know, the, um, the, the misdirection of what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, I mean, all of these things are, and, and the global rise in a lack of trust in institutions, a lack of trust in government. And interestingly enough, so much of that lack of trust is exported from the United States. Um, a country that loves to wave its flag and beat its chest and talk about how great its its government is, and yet that is the single greatest influence globally on undermining people's trust in their institutions. Well said. Uh, beautiful. Jordan, where can people find out more about you? Oh, the easiest place to find out more about me is on LinkedIn, I guess. <laughs> Just look for my LinkedIn profile. Um uh, or of course, to find out more about my um, my group, you can go to the melbourneangels.com website um, and happy to engage with people in conversation wherever they are.